as we gather for worship today, the psalmist reminds us that Christ is our cornerstone and our sure foundation. The stone which the builders rejected, he says, has become the chief cornerstone. In insecure times, let us gather for worship and reaffirm our faith in Christ, who is indeed our chief cornerstone. We're so glad to welcome each of you to worship this day, and we ask you to complete the red ritual of friendship pad that you find in each of your pews so we can have a record of your visit with us today. Please note that contributions are still being accepted to provide cleaning and hygiene supplies for recent hurricane victims. If you would like to make a monetary contribution, a bucket marked Hurricane Relief is located in the second floor foyer outside the church office, and then also you'll find one in Fellowship Hall. Please also take note of the announcement in our bulletin concerning our weekly prayer list. In order for us to keep that list current, we ask you to please contact the church office weekly with any changes that you may have. Also, pay close attention to the Women's Fellowship news and announcements concerning some changes in their fundraising efforts as well as upcoming events. I'd like to call on Amanda Shumpert for an announcement. Good morning. In your bulletin today, you will find a pink piece of paper outlining the purchase of new choir chairs for our choir loft. In doing so, we would like to offer the opportunity for members of the congregation to purchase a chair or chairs in honor or in memory of someone special to you. If this is something that interests you, please fill out the form. You can put it in my box in the church office or in the offering plate. Um, also, for the past month, we have enjoyed fantastic food, fellowship, and mission presentations during our Wednesday evening Calvary at the Table programming. The past four weeks, we've seen and heard presentations from Hope, Anthony's Plot, City with Dwellings, and Sunnyside Ministry. This week, we will hear from Riverwood Therapeutic Writing Center. Riverwood provides equine-assisted activities to improve muscle tone, balance, posture, coordination, and motor development, as well as emotional well-being in children and adults with special needs. Each week offers informative and important information about incredible organizations around Winston-Salem and opportunities for you to be involved personally if you so choose. And each week is individually programmed. So if you miss one, you're not behind on anything. Additionally, we have a women's Bible study that meets in the Burke Conference Room. The youth are actively engaged in study with Mark and Lane. And I'm leading the children in a walk through the Bible using Legos, which I can tell you is a lot of fun. Um, there will be pictures of their creations up soon. If you um, do not already do so, please consider making this midweek ministry a part of your weekly schedule and your commitment to the education at Calvary. Thank you. An announcement from Mark DeCoste, our youth director. Mark. Good morning. The youth are sponsoring a uh, luncheon after worship today um, for the 2017 Crop Walk in Winston-Salem. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the crop walk, it actually started in the 1960s um, and since then has sort of spread to over 2,000 communities um, around the country. And here in Winston-Salem, 75% um, of the proceeds from the crop walk um, support Church World Service, which is sort of the umbrella organization, but 25% of the proceeds from the walk actually support um, local ministries here in Winston-Salem. They support Sunnyside and Crisis Control Ministries. Um, so if you would like, um, you're invited to come down for the baked potato and salad luncheon after worship and to learn a little bit more about the crop walk. So thank you all. We certainly want to thank Linda Seipel for her assistance in worship today. Let us now worship our God.
Christ is our cornerstone, on him alone we build. With his true saints alone the courts of heaven are filled. On his great love our hopes we place of present grace and joys above. Shall we stand? Second Coming on page 109 in your blue worship hymnal. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Let the people of the Lord praise the Holy and Righteous One. On the day of the Lord, justice will roll on like a river, and righteousness like a never failing stream. Almighty God, we lift our hearts to you. And our eyes are fixed upon your unchanging glory. We rejoice in the promise of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the power and majesty. and humility, and who will come again with power and for all to see. Our Lord Jesus is coming again is a two-edged sword. It comforts us, convinces us anew that your grace is beyond measure. Yet it also confronts us, compels us to recognize our own unrighteousness. Let us put aside our false pride, confess our sins, and receive your affirming love.
and will forgive us our sins, and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Our sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from the earth. In that day he will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. Let us rejoice in his salvation. who ascended into heaven after his resurrection will come again in the same way. The Lord himself will come from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be called together with them to meet the Lord. And so we will be with the when Christ returns, he will establish justice and righteousness in the earth. He will bring to fulfillment the kingdom of God, and he will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. In that day, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of we believe the day of Christ's return will be one of rejoicing and vindication for God's people, but will also be a day of judgment for those who have rejected Christ's reign. We believe our loving God desires that none should perish, and so we ask to be empowered with zeal and humility to proclaim the word of truth in the world too often unaware of coming judgment. We join with the saints throughout the ages in prayer. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. by such a great cloud of witnesses, indeed, by all the saints who have gone before us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that is so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Christ, bringer of justice, we ask for courage and boldness to stand by the poor and oppressed to work for justice in this present world as we anticipate your perfect justice to come. Christ.
Christ, hope of the world, we ask that your Holy Spirit move among those who have yet to hear, that their hearts may be softened and prepared for the message of their gospel. Christ, Lord of the Church, we ask for help for your Church to live as you truly are, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to you, who live to declare your praises, for you call us. As we receive our morning offering, we remember the words of the psalmist, Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts.
God, we thank you this day for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our sure and steadfast foundation. May we build our lives upon Christ. May we build this church upon Christ. And may you use us and the offerings that we now bring to advance the work of your kingdom throughout the world until that glorious day when you come again to receive us to yourself. These things we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our epistle lesson is from Philippians 3, 4 through 14, 1, 10, 23 in your pew Bibles. Even though I, too, have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made, has made me his own. <coughs> Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> Our gospel lesson is from Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect you, my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they say to themselves, This is the, the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priest and the Pharisees heard these parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him 
as the prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. the children to come forward.
Let us join now in a time of meditation and prayer. O oh God, you are our help in ages past, and you are our hope for years to come. We come together this day to once again give you thanks and praise for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is indeed our cornerstone and our sure foundation. In a world where we are often surrounded by insecurity, by division, by crisis both natural and of our own doing, our fear can sometimes get the best of us. We can feel so overwhelmed by all that is happening in our world and around us. Yet you call us to cast our anxiety upon you, to rest secure in your promises, and to trust with the old spiritual that you do indeed have the whole world in your hands. Teach us again in times of worship and prayer that we can have everything that the world offers, but it's ultimately nothing compared to possessing a relationship with you. The things of the world will never satisfy our hunger or our thirst, yet you alone stand beckoning to us to find what we need in you because your promises are eternal and they never fail. So hear us in these moments, Lord, as we pray for those near and far. We ask that you would hear the prayers that we make for members of our own congregation who are facing times of illness. We pray that you would grant to each one the assurance of your peaceful and healing presence. We ask as well that you would draw near to those who are struggling, whatever their difficulty, and grant to each one the blessed peace of your love. Lord, we pray especially today for those who are in authority, that you would grant unto them wisdom and guidance, both to our own leaders and the leaders of nations across the globe. Give them thoughts of peace and reconciliation, and help us always to seek peaceful measures that the nations may learn war no more. So be now our vision, O Lord. Help us to see the world through your eyes. And may our worship this day be pleasing to you because we offer it in the name of him who is indeed our rock and our sure foundation, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
us pray together. O Lord, open now our hearts, open now our ears, that we may hear your word and that it may penetrate the very depths of our souls that we will find in you all we need for the living of our days. And now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you because you are indeed our strength. You are our Redeemer. Amen. We live in a resume-oriented culture where whether we like it or not, we have to portray ourselves in the best possible light, whether it's applying for college or for a new job. It seems we often have to market ourselves like we're selling a product. Susanna Breslin recently wrote an article for Forbes magazine entitled, She Got the Promotion, You Didn't, Here's Why. And in the article, she observes that one reason I suggest that you may get passed over for a promotion is because you're not selling yourself. You forgot to sell you to the potential employer. Your co-worker sold herself like a pro and the boss bought it. A resume, as we know, is that vital document where you list all that you have learned and achieved and then you even may highlight your skills and how they have been used effectively in the past. One writer even jokingly said that we might consider accentuating our resumes when we turn them in. One of my first jobs, he says, was work in a grocery store bagging groceries. I went to my next interview And my resume did not say bag boy, but customer service representative. In a resume, he says, we put ourselves forward in the best possible light. In today's epistle text taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, he presents a rather impressive resume to his listeners particularly to those in that community who are saying that because Paul is now a Christian, he really doesn't know what it means to be a Jew. The criticism comes from folks at Philippi who were known in that time as Judaizers. What in the world were Judaizers? They were Jews who had converted to Christianity But they believed that when Gentiles came into the Christian faith, they had to strictly observe the Mosaic law, including the command to circumcise all males as a sign of the covenant. Well, Paul believed and taught the exact opposite. He said that one is saved not by strictly observing the laws of Israel, but by one's faith in Jesus Christ. One is not saved by a resume of good works, or how strictly one observes the law of Israel, but by a gift of grace that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because Paul, a Jew by ethnicity, now understands one is saved by faith and not by the law, the Judaizers are trying to convince all the Philippian community that Paul doesn't know what he's talking about, that Paul doesn't really understand what it means to be a Jew. They say if he had been reared a really good Jew, he would know better. Now being the trained debater that he was from the ancient world, Paul responds to this criticism of the Judaizers by laying out his resume. He begins by talking about his status. He reminds readers that he was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law of Israel. He calls himself an Israelite because he believes he has an absolute purity in his ancestry. He even says that he was a member of the tribe of Benjamin, which was a very elite 
Aristar, Ar, Ar, I can say that word in a minute, aristocratic tribe that was known to have produced Saul, the king of Israel. He says, in fact, I am a blue-blooded Hebrew. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. But that's not all he says. Then he goes on to list all of his accomplishments. He says he's a trained Pharisee, that he grew up in Tarsus where he was trained by one of the most prominent rabbis of the ancient world, Gamaliel. And if you were trained by Gamaliel on that day, it was like saying you had gone to Harvard University. As a Pharisee, one of those who separated themselves, Paul kept even the smallest detail of the Jewish law. He was such a good Jew and so full of zeal for the tradition of his fathers that he says, I was even one of the first to persecute these Christians. And he concludes his accomplishments by saying, when I was a Jew, I followed the law so perfectly that I was blameless. Now, when you read all of this in Paul's account, you begin to think that Paul's sort of a braggart. <laughs> a person who's boasting about all of their achievements and all of their possessions, but it's really the exact opposite because Paul lists all of these things simply to say to the Judaizers in Philippi, yes, I do know what I'm talking about because I am a blue-blooded Hebrew of Hebrews and I know that the grace of God in Christ has come to me and all the stuff I used to think was so important is not important at all. One commentator summed it up this way. Paul claimed all of these things as a credit to his personal balance sheet but when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, he wrote all of those things off his debts. They were in fact useless. They were garbage to be laid aside that he might accept the grace of God. Now after sharing this very long resume to those who do not think he knows what he's talking about, Paul concludes, and I share his words from Eugene Peterson's The Message, another translation of the New Testament. He says, The very credentials that these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and I'm throwing in the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things that I once thought were so important are now gone from my life Compared to the high privilege of knowing Jesus Christ as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is now insignificant. He says, it's dung. I've dumped it all in the trash, he says, so I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. What's the most important thing on our personal resumes? How much education we have? Who we're related to? How much money we have invested? The social circle we run in, where we live, what we drive. What's most important to us? Are we willing to throw it all away? To even consider the things of this world garbage that we might more closely know? Jesus Christ. Paul was pretty clear about it, wasn't he? He said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, well educated, a Pharisee no less. But when he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus road, everything he thought was important no longer mattered. His status Everything he had achieved was refuse, trash, worth nothing to him. David L. Roper tells the story of visiting his son and rummaging around in his garage where he found all the trophies his son had won in his many years of athletic competition. 
He said, there they were in a box about to be thrown out. Roper remembers thinking about all of the blood and sweat and tears and money that had gone into his son receiving every award and to think he was now about to throw all those awards in the trash. They no longer seemed to have any value to him. It reminded me, Roper said, of a whimsical children's poem by Shel Silverstein called Hector the Collector. And the poem describes all the things that Hector loved over the years. He loved them more than shining diamonds. He loved them more than glistening gold. And then Hector called to all of his friends, Come and share my treasure trunk. And all the people came and looked and they called it junk. So it will be at the end of our lives. All our possessions all the things that we've spent a lifetime working for will mean very little when we come to the end of the way because they're fleeting. They're temporary. But a relationship with Jesus Christ is the one thing that lasts forever. It's our security in a world of insecurity and it's still ours until the last hour when we breathe our last In 1888, history records that the Swedish Prince Oscar relinquished his royal title and his right to succeed to the Norwegian throne in order to marry a commoner whom he fell in love with, a woman who deeply influenced his life of faith. Many have attributed the words to a beloved hymn to his pen during that time. I'd rather have Jesus, he said, than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or to be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything, anything that the world affords today. Is there anything we'd rather have than a relationship with Jesus Christ? The events of this last week in Las Vegas have left all of us in a state of shock. It's hard for us to fathom, isn't it, even to conceive of such carnage occurring in this country, yet random acts of violence are slowly becoming The new normal, the innocent deaths of 58 people who were simply enjoying themselves at a concert leaves us with a new reality that none of us are immune to. There's really no place where we are completely secure anymore. And that's not a good feeling to have, is it? Yet there is one reality that is certain. There is one truth that is secure when we have Jesus Christ and the hope that He gives us. We have everything that we need. We have peace in the midst of any storm. We have security and hope and comfort and love. Paul so beautifully reminds us of this in another letter. For we know if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Guns may fire. Weapons may be launched. There may be chaos in the streets. Division may inhabit the halls of government and the streets of our cities, but there is one thing that remains. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we accept Him as Savior by faith in our hearts, He gives us each such hope and the loving assurance that we are never alone. This is the priceless treasure that St. Paul was willing to throw everything away for, his credentials, his accomplishments, his worldly goods. He knew that Christ 
was the only thing that ever really lasts. It's the only thing that really matters. It's the only thing, brothers and sisters, that is eternal and secure. It has been said through time that all that which pleases is but for a moment. And all that which troubles is but for a moment. But that which is important is eternal. What's most important in our lives? What would we be willing to throw everything away for? John Piper wrote a best-selling book called Desiring God. And he reflects that our joining Paul and counting All as loss means that we will seek to deal with the things of this world in a way that show that they are not our treasure, but rather that Christ is our treasure. That is, we will hold things loosely. We will share all things generously and ascribe value to everything in its relationship to Christ. Renouncing all or counting everything as loss means that if we lose any or all of the things this world can offer, we will not lose our joy or our treasure or our life because Christ is our joy and our treasure and our life. Christ is all our vision, our eternal hope. If we look to this world for security, For hope, we will not find it. The only way it can be found, the only way our hunger can ever be helped is by the satisfaction of Christ. This year we'll celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And one of its great reformers, Martin Luther, who lived during very turbulent, very insecure times, he penned these lines of an eternal truth that ring through the centuries, that ring in our hearts today. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the reminder in Paul's letter that we are called to regard the things of this world as nothing compared to a relationship with you. May we invite you into our hearts that you may dwell there that you may give us all that we need, that you may forgive us, love us, and offer us a security which is beyond all measure. Bless us this day with your vision that we may see the world with your eyes. Amen.